Welcome to Mind, Body, Spirit, Food. I'm your host, Nikki Sizemore, and in this podcast, we'll explore the rituals, traditions, and cultural influences around food and how they connect us to our minds, our bodies, our spirits, the earth, and our communities. This is a space that's dedicated to bringing more presence, ease, and joy into the process of feeding ourselves. Let's dive in. Hello, and welcome back to the show. Okay, my friends, today's conversation is just, it's so good. It's filled with so many nuggets of wisdom. I really think that everyone listening is going to walk away with just one or two or more aha moments. I speak with Abigail Rose Clark, who is a writer, somatic educator, and artist. She's been teaching somatics internationally since 2011, and her new book, Returning Home to the Body, Reimagining the Relationship Between Our Bodies and the World, will be released in January of 2024. Abigail and I discuss what it means to be in relationship, not just with other people, but with our bodies, with the foods we eat, and with the world around us. She describes how when we return to the body, developing a deeper relationship with ourselves, we open the door to curiosity. Instead of feeling like we need to control our bodies or the foods we eat, like through yoga, meditation, diets, cleanses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we instead ask ourselves what we authentically need right now in this moment, without judgment. We also discuss pleasure and how we often view pleasure as a commodity, as something we need to earn, as opposed to something that we can access for ourselves just by being alive. We touch on change and grief, the role of food in comforting us. I mean, there's so much here, but I want to get to the episode. I think you guys are going to love this one. As always, you can support this work by leaving a comment, by sharing the podcast with others or on social media. That's actually incredibly helpful. You can rate the podcast in your podcast app and you can sign up for the Mind, Body, Spirit, Food newsletter where I go into some of these topics in depth as well as provide weekly recipes and more. And if you become a paid subscriber for just $5 a month, you fund this entire ad free space. And I'm so grateful for all of you paid subscribers. All right, my friends, let's dive in. Hi, Abigail. Welcome to the show. I'm so pleased that you're here. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much, Nikki. This is really wonderful. Well, I had the pleasure. You sent me a little sneak preview of your book, and I read the first chapter, and I felt like you were streaming through my consciousness. <laughs> I was so I am so excited to read this book. But before we dive into some of the topics that you discuss in the book and that I want to discuss here in the podcast, I'm going to ask you the first question that I ask all of my guests so we can get to know you a little bit and your relationship with food and that is what is your cultural upbringing and how did that influence your relationship to food? Oh, that's a great question. So, I was raised in the United States on a small subsistence farm, only child of a single mom. So we raised sheep and chickens and goats. And one eventful year, we decided to raise pigs, which was its own (laughs) chaos. And we had a garden where we grew a lot of the food that my mom would can and preserve. And my mom is like, she's part squirrel. She just is happiest in the kitchen when she's (laughs) preserving food. Mm -hmm. So that definitely influenced my relationship to food. On the flip side of that, we were also quite poor. I think subsistence farming, you know, it was real. And so Mm. if we weren't growing it, we were relying on food banks. And so there was this kind of dichotomy there of like high quality and fresh. And then, you know, kind of the sad state of American food bank food. So Mm. it's been a complicated relationship. I'm rather public about the fact that I had a long eating disorder throughout my teens and then my 20s. And it was returning to, yeah. So many people, especially in our generation where it's like, you know, Kate Moss was the idealized body. Oh, yeah. 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 So much of the cultural paradigms that we grew up in. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So it was organic farming, returning to organic farming when I was in my late teens, early 20s that helped me pull out of that because there was just this beauty that I got to return to around growing Mm. food that helped me sort of restore the relationship. And then, yeah, so without wanting to veer too far off, I have a complicated relationship with food, but I'm grateful that I was so immersed from a young age from birth, really, in what it means to cook and grow and preserve food and eat seasonally. And that has definitely stayed with me. 
I love that. I'm so grateful that you were willing to share that. In fact, my first ever podcast is titled My Complicated Relationship with Food. (laughs) And here I've been in the food industry for, you know, 20 years, over 20 years. But as a teen and in my early 20s, my relationship with food was totally fraught and Mm -hmm. one of stress. And what's interesting, and this all ties into the conversation we're going to have today, because I was completely disembodied. I was Mm -hmm. not in my body. I didn't trust my body. I had no relationship with my body. Yeah. And I think that's a good segue, actually, into my first question, because in your book, you say this book is about relationships. And, you know, I think people might hear that and say, oh, relationships mean between two people, but really that's not all you mean. You go a Uh lot deeper. So could you describe what that is? Yeah. I relate so deeply to what you're saying about being disembodied and having a relationship with the body that was entirely externally oriented, which as people were raised feminine and female in a culture that pushes that on women in particular, makes sense, right? We don't have to Mm -hmm. wonder why it happened. We can just acknowledge that it did happen. And so in the practice of returning to a relationship with myself, It's been about finding the ways that I relate to myself, within myself, and therefore to the rest of the world, not from an external place of like, how does this look? What do other people think as they see me in this space? How does this fit against a norm? But instead, to be in relationship means that we are in a reciprocal give and take. We're being changed by the other and then also just by the relationship itself. Like if I'm in a relationship with you, it's Mm. not just that you and I are changing each other. It's that something is being created between the two of us that creates something special and unique to us, right? So that's why like our best friends are just so magical to be with because it's not just that, oh, I love you as a person. It's also I love the version of me that I get to breathe into when I'm with you. Mm. So you know, we were talking about, you know, just the fraught, complicated relationship to food, which is such a primal relationship. If you think about it, it's like, this is where the external world gets pulled into the inner world. And the body then is making all of these choices. What am I going to keep and make new cells out of? And what am I going to eliminate? What's going to make me feel good? What's going to make me feel bad? And it's so layered and fraught because of Mm -hmm. all the different ways that the culture relates to food. It's such a cultural thing that, yeah, I don't want to drift off. I want to come back to being asked more questions because I'm sure that it's going to be a conversation that is a give and a take. But the relationships are so deeply abundant in a Mm. multicellular organism. We are just made of relationships. And my body is being shaped and changed by everything, human and more than human, that I am in contact with and also just in the general surroundings to I think to think of an individual, an isolated individual, is so far from the actual truth that mm. I think that's where we can get into some of these more fraught, complicated paradigms because they just it doesn't have a basis in reality, yeah. which is relational. Mm. Mm, there's so <laughs> much here. I <laughs> literally have I have goosebumps, and there's something that you said that I haven't thought about before. I talk about relationships, but I often term it connection within my own work because Mm. I do believe that the more we can connect to ourselves, the more we can therefore create connections with the foods we eat, with the land, and therefore with each other. But what I love that you just said that I kind of want to reiterate to the listeners is that, yes, it's about those connections, but the connections themselves, the relationships themselves kind of create their own energetic force. And I hadn't Mm -hmm. thought about that. It's not just you and I, but there's something about you and I together that has its own power. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I just need to like, let that simmer through me a little bit because that's bigger. That's not just A and B equals C. It's kind of like A and B equal A plus B plus C plus D. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, it's like one plus one equals 11, right? Yeah, it's like we're not losing (laughs) ourselves in the other. Right. We're creating something entirely different and more. Yeah. So where did this passion for relationships start for you? I know we talked a little bit about your background, a little bit about food, but, you know, as I've kind of started to poke my toes into your work, you are fascinated with the body and with the relationships within our bodies and how that 
relates to our relationships outside of our bodies. So yeah, why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do have a positive obsession to quote Octavia Butler. She has a quote that I include in the book that any obsession can be good if it's a positive obsession. I'm mm-hmm. paraphrasing there, but the body is definitely mine. I think it does relate to the realities of being an only child to a single mom living in a rural area. The sort of pithy joke way of saying, why am I so obsessed with relationships is because they weren't easy for me. I didn't understand a lot of them, right? Like I felt Mm. removed from my peers in a lot of ways because here I was just, you know, single mom, no kids around, just kind of, you know, like hang out with my dog way more than any other people. And my dear dog that just passed 18 years together. And I would still rather spend time with her than almost any other person. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Put it bluntly. Mm -hmm. So I think it was partly just being really confused by Mm. human relationships, being the kid that got picked out a lot, being then afraid to stand up for other people because I was afraid that then it would just turn on to me. Then growing Mm -hmm. up and being kind of like shocked and even ashamed of having done that as a younger child. All of these things kind of related into being interested in how things work and being more Mm. aligned with the ways that the natural world worked than the ways that it seemed like human relationships were supposed to work. Like gossip seemed like such a cruel thing, but Mm. the way that a spider weaves its web seemed like such a beautiful thing. So Mm. I was more interested in that than the other. And then my relationship with my body was healed in part by organic farming, but then it really took a shift when I met my primary somatic teacher. Patty Townsend is like my somatic mom, basically. She's wonderful. Can you really quickly describe somatic? Because I know a lot of listeners that just might go over their heads. So just go there really quick. Yeah, that's such a good question because it's a word, and I talk about this in my book, it's a word that lives in this really weird place where even if listeners are aware of somatic, because it's a pretty big buzzword on Instagram and Mm -hmm. TikTok for sure, but it's getting used as sort of a stand-in for meditation or mindfulness or just having to do with kind of like the body. And then the nervous system gets kind of placed as like, oh, it's all about the nervous system. And it's like, well, the body's a lot more than just one nervous system, right? So somatic, and if we look at the word, somatic comes from the Greek soma, which means the body, or I could even make it a little clearer and consider that it means the whole body. Mm. Whereas anatomy, it comes from, I think it's Latin, ana and tomia, to cut up into pieces, quite literally. So anatomy looks at the parts, and it's really mm. important to look at the parts so that we can understand how they work. So what has happened kind of since the Enlightenment is that the parts get sort of pulled away and the messiness of the whole gets ignored. Yeah. And somatics is this, at least in the way that I engage with it, is this return to the whole. And so the whole body, the whole world, the whole of it all is influencing every single individual part. So when I talk about somatics, I'm talking about the body. That's kind of like the Cliff Notes version. But I'm talking about the whole of the body in relationship with every other body and the body of the world as a whole. Wow. Okay. (laughs) Thank you. That's so helpful. And I think that's going to clarify a lot for people. And so you met Patty Townsend. She became your teacher. Yeah, she became my teacher. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, honestly, I had healed aspects of my fraught relationship with my body and food. I got started in yoga because it felt like, okay, well, this is the way that I can control my body Mm. through yoga and through fasting Mm. and cleanses. And I remember my acupuncturist at one point being like, you're pretty clean. Like, you don't need to do another <laughs> cleanse. And I was like, what are you talking about? No, I have to like, you know, just, mm, yeah, control. that sort of fraught thing. Yeah, so Patty's approach to yoga, what she calls a body yoga, she developed it. And like, I suddenly was able to feel just how beautiful the relationship is between my body and the earth. And her alignment is much more relational than positional. So it's not just like, okay, put your Mm. arm here, put your leg there, put your other arm here, put your other leg there. It's like, can you feel how when you push into the earth, the earth is going to push back up into you? And then that's going to express itself in this relationship with space and gravity. It's not just like, okay, yeah, now you're doing the thing that gets called warrior two. It's like, no, this is going to grow and build and be expressed through you which then also makes it so much more rich and alive and not just, you know, oh, we have to be 
thin and young in order to be able to Mm. do this stuff, right? It's like you can experience this from wherever you are in your own life and however it is that your body feels. Mm. So yeah, that was pretty essential. And it was a very central turning point in my life was meeting her for sure. What amazing reframe, I think still a lot of people who are listening without knowing and I absolutely fall into this category and have fallen into this category. But when we think of movement practices like yoga, we often approach them as a way to control our body, as a mm-hmm. way to meet these, whether they're physical expectations, as opposed to a way to get to know our body. And through that inquiry and curiosity to better understand ourselves. But then as you say, once we better understand ourselves, we better understand the world. All of those relationships stem from that really authentic relationship. Yeah. So I love that. You know, I think the way yoga is positioned often is to its detriment in some way, because I do think it is just about getting to know ourselves and getting to know our breath and all of that. Absolutely. But really a beautiful thing of having the mindset and having the framework of somatics meaning whole means Mm -hmm. that everything is related to everything else. And so we don't even have to just harp on westernized yoga. I mean, I could fill several podcasts talking about how (laughs) kind of twisted a lot of that culture is, but we can look at how, you know, westernized yoga focuses on controlling the body. So does, you know, hit workouts. So does, you know, Mm -hmm. like all of it. Yeah. And none of those things have to be that. No, right? Like exactly. you can work out from a joy, but food yeah. too. Like that's like, you know, your primary wheelhouse. Yeah. Like eating clean and intermittent fasting and, you know, just all of the different kind of ways that we approach the rich and pleasurable and just deep act of eating that gets approached from a place of control. Right. Mm. I need to eat this way so that I'm a good person. If I yeah. eat that way, I'm a bad person. Mm-hmm. I deserve this because I did this. But I, oh, I'm being so bad right now. I can't believe I'm eating all of this. And it's just like, what are we doing? <laughs> Why yeah, are we doing I, it this way? I've talked about that before on this fallacy that we have. This reminds me of what you were saying is that food is transactional. Yeah. And what goes in, what goes in must come out. We're told this all the time by nutritionists, you know, caloric counts and all of this. And Mm -hmm. once you really start to feel in food, into food, it is not a transaction. No. It is a relationship, but it is not a transaction. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. Hi there. I just wanted to pop in really quickly and let you know that an easy way that you can support this work is to sign up for the Mind, Body, Spirit Food newsletter. In the weekly newsletter, you'll get brand new recipes each week, along with my thoughts, ideas, and practical tips for how to bring more ease and joy and freedom into the kitchen. The newsletter is free, although if you become a paid subscriber for just a couple bucks a month, you'll have access to the full recipe archive, along with Q&As, weekly threads, and other fun perks. And if you're already a subscriber, thank you. You can share the newsletter with your friends or even give a gift subscription. I've popped a link into the show notes where you can sign up. Thank you all for listening. And now back to the show. You say in the first chapter, this is just a line I love so much. You say, in returning to the body and remembering how to listen to our own blood and bones and glorious guts, we return to ourselves and to each other. We've already kind of approached this from a few different angles, but can you go into that a little bit more? What does it mean to return to ourselves? In light of what we were just talking about, like control and transactional relationships, even around something as basic and fundamental as food. Mm -hmm. Returning to ourselves, for me, in one key way, it's bringing a curiosity to myself and how I'm feeling as I'm feeling it. So that rather than being like, oh, I can't believe I'm just, I'm being so lazy. I'm, I can't believe I've just been eating so much sugar. I can't believe that, I haven't worked out like in several days. I can't like just all those things, right? That kind of like running monologue that can go and just being like, oh, I'm so bad. I'm so terrible. Oh, instead of returning to myself would be like, oh, hey, babe, what's going on? Like, what are you needing right now? right? Mm. Is a simple and has, for me, has to be like pretty continual 
return, you know, and I love the word return because there's movement in it. So you're returning to yourself and just being like, hey, I'm noticing that, like, you know, I haven't wanted to get out of bed and stop watching my comfort show in a few days. Like, so what's up? Right. Mm. Like, really, what is up? Because sometimes I just, I'm just exhausted and life is just really just hammered me with some punches. And maybe some time with my comfort show is really what I need. And sometimes sure. I'm avoiding myself. Right. Mm. So I have often kept on my fridge a Venn diagram that says almost anything can be healing and anything can be an escape. Mm. Right. Cause we've seen it. Meditation cleanses, mm. you know, eating clean can be an escape. Absolutely. But almost anything can be healing. Like, you know, sometimes the most healing food is the ho-ho. If that's really like, if that's going to bring you back to a feeling of comfort and nostalgia, and it's just going to be this amazing experience, then yes, sure. Is your body going to maybe be a little upset if that's all you eat? Yeah. Because, you know, that's just basic science. But there's no such thing as a bad food if Mm. it's going to bring you to an experience of love and care. Right. Yes, 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 so. yes, 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 yes. Yes. <laughs> I love all of that so much because it's that approach that we have, that curiosity that we have. And I was just writing this morning my newsletter that's going out this week, which when you all hear this podcast, this will be, you know, a month or two old. <laughs> but <laughs> it's about that noise in our heads. I talk about food noise is the term I talk about in this newsletter, but also just the mental noise that if we're not aware of it, can end up controlling our lives and yeah. we don't even know it. And that's certainly for me when I had an eating disorder in my late teens and early 20s, food was, it was like constant static in my brain. Mm-hmm. What should I eat? What shouldn't I eat? What's healthy? What's not healthy? When should I eat? And then I would eat and it wouldn't stop. And mm-hmm. then it would be like, was that good? Was that bad? Do I need to work out? It was completely exhausting. And it wasn't until, I mean, even now within my life, I'm a very mental person. I love reading and studying, but if I'm not careful, that mental side of me wants to take over and wants Mm -hmm. to be like, all right, we're going to go do all of these things. We're going to get all the work done. And what happens if I don't see it, then I become very disconnected to my body, to my emotional body, to my spiritual body, to the other messages that have become so valuable as I live my life now in my 40s. But it's just that, I guess what I'm coming back to is like, we need to take that time to, we don't need to do anything, but I like to take that time to get curious about Mm -hmm. what that noise is. Where is that coming from? Is it an old pattern? Is it because I'm in a mode of fear? Is it because I'm stressed out? Or, you know, what is it? And with having a massive amount of compassion for myself, because this is what we are. We're human and this is going to happen. Yeah. Like what a human thing to make a mistake, right? (laughs) Yes. I remember I sent my former professor, I sent her like what I thought was the finalized draft. And she read it all cover to cover. Thank you, Barbara from Curtis, so much. <laughs> and then she wrote me back and she was just like, hey, chapter eight. Like, she was like, you described this pretty much backwards. And I was like, oh, no. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> and I wrote her back. I was like, oh, my goodness. Thank you so much. I'm really so embarrassed. Like, I just I had all this, like, you know, like shame come up. And she was just like, oh, no, I remember when you were my student, you said, oh, no, it's just such a human thing to make a mistake. And I was like, oh, "Oh, that's right. I did say that. And now when it's my turn, it's no, it's not human to make a mistake. But it was so (laughs) sweet of her to just be like, oh, it's fine. No, no, it's fine. Yeah. (laughs) I love that. I love that. That's how we grow, right? Yeah. It's such a human, what a human thing to be a nervous, worried overthinker. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And that's where... I think work like somatic work is really helpful for, especially for us mental people that love to get into the things. It's so fascinating for you because as you say in your introduction or in the first chapter that you love science, you Mm -hmm. love study, you know, our minds are critical for our growth and our evolution. And there is a balance there that Mm -hmm. often maybe gets neglected within our culture. Yeah. Absolutely. I love science and I had major math phobia. Like the process of learning science in a group or math in a group is really hard for me because I learn it a little bit slower. Mm -hmm. And so I love science. And also some of my worst experiences have been in classrooms where I've been trying Mm. to learn calculus, like just 
trying so hard and not doing a good job at it. But I mean, the mind is amazing and methods are really helpful. Like the scientific method is beautiful in the way that it prioritizes the continual effort to move closer to the truth. If you realize that this is no longer true, that better research or better technology means that this isn't true anymore, we move closer to the truth now. Nothing is ever proven according to science. We just have these theories that have really been able to hold water over time, right? Mm. But in order for it to stay true, it has to continue to be true as we learn more. Otherwise, it gets adjusted. And I think that's so beautiful. Like, I think that is a really beautiful way to go about the complicated work of being a human. If Mm. it's still true, I'll keep on integrating it. If it proves itself to not be true, I have to let it go. Mm. That just goes right back to this noise or maybe some of that noise that we have in our mental field sometimes is just old patterns. Old patterns are hard to let go. You know, we create these neural synapses that can be hard to change. But I, myself included, think a lot of people fear that change and Mm -hmm. fear that ability to say, this is no longer working. Let's pivot. I think that's a very scary place for people to go. Absolutely. It's a scary place to go. Okay. This is where I'd love to just share a little kind of like science nerdy thing. Yes. So in one of the chapters, I'm talking about the cell membrane and how cell membranes are actually this really beautiful proof that at the deepest level of our cells, we actually do understand healthy boundaries because cell membranes are adaptable. They're semi-permeable. They let some things in, they let some things out they're able to respond to changing environments. It's really pretty amazing that at the core of us, we do understand this. Mm. It's a little bit harder, you know, once we get big and complex like the humans we are, but at the core of us, we understand it. But everything alive, or actually every, everything is a carbon-based cell membrane. So fungi and bacteria and animals and plants, everything is a carbon-based life form. And Carbon-based molecules allow for life to happen because they create both covalent and ionic bonds. So some bonds that stay together really firmly, but not permanently. They will change, Mm. right? But they're pretty solid. And then Mm. ionic bonds, and they change pretty easily, right? But without getting into the weeds of chemistry, any time that a carbon bond changes, there's a release of heat and energy as the molecules try and find their balance point again. When I was learning that, you know, one of the ways that I approach learning science with a mind that really gets overwhelmed by math and science kind of quickly is I try and make it into relationship models. Mm. And so when I was learning that, I was like, oh, well, of course, change is kind of scary and chaotic because if at the very molecular level, a change in the bonds creates kind of heat and a little moment of chaos as things kind of try to settle themselves into their new arrangements... Well, and of course, that's going to feel like that when it's happening out in the tangible world as well, Mm -hmm. right? So I don't have to fear the chaos. It's just part of the process. And if I can, in fact, take a little bit more levity with it, then that makes it a little bit less daunting as well. For me, learning that was a freedom to let go of the idea that I could somehow control my way into a completely easy life where I could handle anything as it came, Mm. right? Mm. Because chaos is just part of it. The molecular level chaos is part of it. So prepare for the chaos rather than trying to prepare your way out of chaos. Mm. I have found to be more helpful and I still get it wrong all the time, but you know, it's at least a little bit more helpful. To know that is part of the foundation of what we're built on. Yeah, like all life has changed. Of course. (laughs) (laughs) Of course. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, it does. It takes away the fear and it enables us to have agency yeah. during the time of change to be like, oh, okay, this is mm-hmm. hard. And mm-hmm. that's that it's supposed to be. And that's yeah. okay. Yeah. And then that returning to ourselves, rather than being like, you should be able to handle this by now. Like, how many times is this hard for you? And then it's just like, oh, of course, mm. this is hard. Of course, you're wanting your comfort show and your comfort foods because this yeah. is hard. Yeah. Okay. Right. Rather yeah. than being like, no. Get back out there. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Right. Which is the, you know, the mental dogma a lot of us grew up with was like, push it, push it, work hard, harder, more productivity, which I think a lot of us in in our generation were unlearning that and undoing those patterns. Yeah, day by day. Day by day. (laughs) (laughs) 
So I love to talk about pleasure. I've spoken Mm. a lot about pleasure in my own work. I do believe that within the realm of food, pleasure is a great way for us to connect to our bodies. But I also think that within pleasure, there's a certain element of resistance, of resisting cultural structures that tell us that bodies are meant to be controlled or dominated. When we own our own pleasure, we gain a level of sovereignty, a level of autonomy. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about pleasure, if that plays into the work within your book or into your own work. And Absolutely. Yeah. Let's just go from there. <laughs> yeah. I want to preface this by saying that for all listeners, and for you included, if you haven't yet read Adrian Murray Brown's book, Pleasure Activism, Mm-mm. that's amazing. I will link that. Yeah. And also exploring the work of Audre Lorde and her Mm, essay. I think it's called, I forget the name of the essay on the erotic, but another one to link to. Because my work wouldn't be as rich and full of depth as it is if it weren't for Black feminist writers and thinkers. And those two are high on the list. Thank you. Yeah. So this idea of pleasure as a commodity is so tied into the ways that the embodiment industry has, and I call it an industry on purpose. It's like the embodiment industry is, it's like a billion dollar industry. If you count all the ways that yoga, meditation, working out, all this stuff has been commoditized. Mm. It's in the billions now. So it's an industry. When you have apps like Calm and Headspace that are worth, I think Calm crossed the billion mark recently. When that's happening, we have to just explore We had to put our good thinking caps on and be like, okay, where is this benefiting extractive capitalism? Where is this benefiting the idea that humans are meant to be productive and to serve this kind of like machine that makes a few people a lot of money, right? And so if you look at that, it's like, okay, well, some of these apps and classes and programs are really just trying to keep us productive and to eke out pleasure in our own productivity, however we can, and then feel like we earned it. So I'm always enjoying something because I earned it or sometimes because it'll help me work better in the future. So I go on a vacation because I earned it and I use a vacation as like a time to prepare for when I'm going to go back into deep work mode. While that's not exactly untrue, you know, there is a beautiful aspect. The body also teaches a lot about just cycles and how there's active cycles and resting cycles. The idea of pleasure as a commodity, it makes it transactional. Like you were saying, food is transactional. So rather than that, if instead I remember that my body is alive with so many senses and not just the external ones, but also, you know, the inner body is sensing and feeling also. If that's happening, then now... Pleasure doesn't have to be something I buy or earn. It can just be something that I experience through being alive and in a body. To be alive and in a body can be really painful. I don't mean to imply that, you know, it's always comfortable. It's It really isn't. And for a lot of people, it makes total sense that the body just wouldn't be a place that they can really comfortably rest into. And I can speak from my own experience is that if I explore the ways that pleasure exists just in the the nature of being alive, then even when there's emotional or physical pain, there can still be a certain layer of pleasure available. Hmm. And then when there isn't that, I'm more able to experience it and embody it more fully. Hmm. Mm. That was just, I've never... You just framed things and worded things in such a beautiful way. I haven't really thought of pleasure as a commodity within that language. And I think that is so empowering. Again, it's kind of lifting the veil a little bit on Mm -hmm. how we view our own pleasure. And is it something that we feel we need to earn? You know, my dogma for a long time, I mean, I grew up hearing this was work hard, play hard. (laughs) And I hate, I absolutely hate that. (laughs) These days, because I actually want to, I don't know, work steady, play steady. I don't know that. I'm just pulling that out. But I yeah, work soft, play soft. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but exactly. Steady is nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but how empowering for us to look at these things that we often think are serving us. Like you mentioned, mm-hmm. like we have to do the meditation. We have mm-hmm. to do the yoga class. 
we have to do the fall eating cleanse or the new year eating cleanse. Mm -hmm. And why? Like the question is, why are you doing that? Yeah, there's Mm -hmm. that curiosity. Why do we Mm -hmm. feel like we need this? I feel Mm -hmm. like I need it because I feel like I didn't eat right over the summer. I enjoyed too many treats. Do I feel like I need this because it's going to somehow like, you know, clear my fog and I'll be a more productive person again? And as someone, you know, you're a nutritionist, you know that there's truth to it. Like if you have found yourself eating a lot of high fat, high salt, high sugar foods, you might be feeling a little bit like, you know, just not your best. And you might find that it is of benefit to eat differently for a little while. So this is not to say that's not true, right? Right. I'm not a nutritionist. I'd have to throw oh, you're that not. out there. So okay. everyone knows. Sorry. No, but <laughs> there is a place for everything. There's, I mean, as I like to say, when we make these decisions, if they're coming from an honest place of I'm feeling low and I just want to get my energy back, to think of them as temporary. And mm. none of these things are meant to be permanent. They're just ways to get you back into yourself and to get you reconnected. Because yeah. most of the time, it's just that you've lost that connection for whatever yeah. reason. And we all do at times. Like that that just happens. Yeah. And that's a beautiful life way is hard. It. <laughs> it is. Yeah. That's a beautiful way to put it. No absolutes. You don't have to go into an absolute Right. About it. In our email exchange, you mentioned that grief has been showing up a lot for you lately. And you mentioned earlier in our conversation that your dog passed away, your dog mm-hmm. of 18 years. Wow. Yeah, I know. How do you think grief relates to this idea of pleasure? Does grief relate to pleasure? And is there a way to tie in food there? Yeah, I mean, I think we've all been in some pretty collective grieving, like since mm-hmm. 2020, if not before mm-hmm. that, right? Mm-hmm. So, and my dog, Lodi, she, she was awesome. We did everything together. We traveled all over. I was joking with a friend recently that the only modes of transportation that she was never on was a cruise ship and a helicopter. So those are the only modes of transportation I've never been on. So (laughs) yeah, we did everything together. Mm. She was just like this bundle of joy and just so awesome. We lived in a touristy spot in Mexico for a while. And I know that she's in so many people's vacation pictures because like I would see people <laughs> taking photos of her because <laughs> she was just such a happy dog. Oh, So, you know, her loss, even though it's like, you know, for a 50 pound dog to make it to 18 years is pretty impressive. Yeah. It was still so hard for me, even though I knew it was happening and she let herself get old nice and slowly. It was still so sad and so like such a wild ride and just this kind of closing of an era. And also, you know, like interspecies love is a really deep love. Mm. Like there Mm. was a a love between us that now when we were talking about at the beginning, it's like the relationship wasn't just her and me. It was also this bond that we created Mm. together. And I had to say goodbye to that in the physical form. Yeah. So, you know, it and then. Grief, when it hits, is so rude, honestly. (laughs) It's just like, it's not polite and civilized. Like Mm -hmm. for a solid week, I had to really, I had to really be careful about where I was and how long I was going to be in public because the tears would just come and they weren't gentle all the time. And of course, food plays into that. I mean, that's why we have the word comfort food, I think. But also, I mm-hmm. think that's why people bring food to funerals. It's like, in yeah. some ways, I think that it can be this kind of like, oh, I don't have to engage with you because you're sad. So let me just give you this casserole. Mm-hmm. But in other ways, like the day that she passed, my partner, who was just a true hero throughout the whole of it, also like, you know, left, went and got food, came back and made an amazing dinner. And it was the first time that I'd had like real food mm-hmm. in days because I'd just been sitting with her and kind of being in that process. And it was such an act of love. Feed me so well. Mm. And I think about that too. Like when I've had other losses, my people who are like my family in Mexico, I remember when I had a loss in my family, I told them and then they immediately like, you know, a few minutes later, they called up to me. They're just like, come on, there's food over here. And they, you know, made sure I ate. And then they just encouraged Mm. me to go take a nap. They were like, okay, I think think it's probably time to rest. And it's like such an act of, deep care to be like, okay, you're not going to have it in you to cook right now. So we're going to feed you. And then you might also not really know what to do with yourself because it's like middle of the day on a weekday, but you should go sleep, right? Mm. Like those kinds of like, just that's why we need each other, especially in grief. But so yeah, of course, food is related to grief. And unfortunately, when we lock ourselves into these ideas of 
good food versus bad food. We might lock ourselves out of some of the ways that food can offer deep, nourishing comfort, mm. right? We're like, let chocolate fudge cake might not be the thing that I should eat for dinner every night, but if it's giving me a true emotional comfort, yeah, then yeah, you know, like go yeah. for it. I feel like I could talk to you for days. <laughs> <laughs> And I have no doubt I could, but we have to wrap things up, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Before we do that, could you just let people know when your book is coming out, where they can find it, where they can find you and all of that good stuff? Yeah. So the release date is January 9th, 2024. You can buy it wherever books are sold. And a really great way to help new authors of independent publishers, because my book is published by North Atlantic Books. But it's distributed by Penguin Random House. So they do a great job. It's everywhere. You can find it anywhere. Mm. But a really great way to support authors, me and anyone else that you want to support, is to go to your local indie bookstore and ask them to carry it. And that way, mm. you know, mm. it just kind of gets the word out. And so you can do that anywhere. The name of the book is Returning Home to Our Bodies. And if you Google it, it'll come up because Penguin Random House does a really great job at that. <laughs> Wonderful. I can't wait to read the whole thing and to have that in my hands. Yeah, I'm so excited. I do have one more question for you. This is another question I ask all of my guests, and it's just a fun one. And it's the way I close every episode. It's your last meal on earth. What would it be oh in this gosh. moment? In this in moment. this moment? Yes. Because it for me, it changes by the hour. But. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's really, that's a difficult one. Okay. It's my last meal on earth. So that also means that like, I don't have to deal with any tummy aches after? No, nothing. <laughs> this, is it. this is it. You're going. All okay, right. Then I'm going to have a vanilla soft serve with rainbow sprinkles. Mm. A big one. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in the Midwest and soft serve is definitely one of my comfort foods. Oh, it's I love so it. good. So yeah. good. Yeah. So that's what I would do. <laughs> if there's no repercussions later, that's what I'm Amazing. doing. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Abigail. It has been a joy. It's been such an inspiring conversation. I know that everyone listening is going to, I think there's going to be an aha moment for absolutely everybody who listens. So thank oh, you for sharing you. your wisdom. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. Thank you so much for listening. If this work resonates with you in any way, you can support it by leaving a review or comment or sharing it with friends. Also, you can sign up for the newsletter, Mind, Body, Spirit, Food. And by becoming a paid member for just $5 a month, you help fund this entire project. Thank you so much to all of you who are already subscribed, especially to those paid subscribers. This work could not happen without you. I'm Nikki Sizemore, and as always, remember to nourish yourself with intention and love.